it against you. I was stupid, I was young, I was hanged by my Judas tongue. There's a philosophy that artists don't quit being creative because they get old, they get old because they quit being creative. How do you feel with Copper Gun you've mastered the trick of mature musically without getting old? Um, I feel like I got old without losing creativity. I don't think it kept me young. I think I'm okay being old and creative at the same time. But I can see why a lot of people, after a while, <sighs> drop the creativity bag and like, all right. <laughs> it's, you have a lot more things to focus on as you get older. There's a lot of things in life. And then you start to realize the good and the bad that come from you putting everything out there to the world. And sometimes people put out as much as they can and then they're left with very little to themselves and they decide to keep the rest of that to themselves. That's, I don't know what else to say. I decided to just keep giving it out, but I don't feel young for it. You've, you've always tread on this premise of mortality within your work. Do you feel that Copper Gone has a little more with regards to the subject than other releases you've recorded? I don't know. I don't know. I, I wrote the record... <laughs> I wrote it during a very tough time, and I wrote it, um, there were part times where I was told I was going to die. I've dealt with a lot of death since my last record came out, but I've always been dealing with that kind of shit. It's not new to me. I, ju I just, I don't know, I think I've, I feel like I started losing more and more that I enjoyed about life, and I started wondering, like, when do I ever get to feel good again? <laughs> I mean, how, like, I can't ever be happy again, uh, the way, you know, like, I remember a time where I wasn't always burdened by all these responsibilities and concerns, and I don't know, so, that's in my music, I, I felt like it was important for me to document that, and not pretend like I'm just this carefree, lottie dotty cat, right. skipping down the street through fields of strawberries, you know? <laughs> You mentioned Cat. Now, at the risk of sounding silly with regards to mortality, were you in any way consciously or subconsciously depicting your cat as being symbolic to time and the superstition that people believe they have nine lives and you being fully, fully conscious of how short yours is? No, I was lucky. I'm lucky enough that in, in instances like when I write Make Em Purr, right. I can speak in total liter literal terms. I can write that in an hour and record it right away, and the symbolism's there, yes, there's a lot of metaphor, but honestly not as much as other songs, unless you look for it, unless you really go out of your way to find it, and I know it's there, but I don't purposely put it there, it just is accidental, uh, what do you call it, uh, yeah, I don't know, accidental metaphor, but it all works. This, this misconception of artists aren't allowed to grow. They true, right. it's true. I mean, our culture in general, not just hip hop, are obsessed with youth. Cater to youth culture, youth, 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 youth. So then when you, and, and then especially in hip hop, we're like, hip hop is youth music. It, it represents the, the youth urban movement. But after 30 or 40 years, when does it stop being that? Because we, all who have involved in ourselves in it, aren't youth anymore, and how do you properly represent that without coming across as um, out of touch? Because I'm not, I'm not going to adapt youth culture just to make myself seem relevant to the youth. I'm gonna need them to meet me halfway, and I expect them to do that, and a lot of us are. Like, if we stayed on top of our craft and we built our skill set as much as we have through these years, and we know what we offer in our music, you're going to be rewarded by that if you know how to take from it when you listen to it. So, um, I don't know the answer to your question, but I do know that it's, it's an obstacle and it's a real thing. It's like, people are so willing to, to push you aside and not give you the time of the day if, if you're not the brand new, new, new. But eat, man, things are moving so fast. Like even the, the the young new act of last year is old already. 
So how, you know, we're thinking long range, like Peace to KRS, we shouted that out early on, we're thinking long range, we mm -hmm. in here, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that we were talking about it earlier, I know your privacy is something you value, value very much, you know, the time you spend both on the road and at home, you like to spend alone. How important was isolation in the writing of this album for yourself? Uh, I don't know, I've always written in isolation, but I don't, it's a, it's a, I don't have to be isolated because I can write, I can write in crowds as long as no one ever talks to me. As long as, if I'm in like a subway station or something, I have no problem with that. I just can't be around people I know. I can't be around people who expect conversation, who expect feedback from me. I need my space. I need to go down my mental rabbit holes without um, interruption and without being derailed into other directions that I wasn't meant to go down. That's what happens when I'm around people who know who I am, who, not as an artist, but even as a person who just like expect a normal adult relationship or a conversation. And that's why I needed isolation, I think, for a lot of my albums, not just this one. This, this time through was a different deal. This was four years of me almost never leaving my house. And that wasn't for my art. I don't know what it was for. It just was, it just was my condition. It was like I preferred that. I didn't want to be around anybody. I never want to talk about anything, and I want to do my work at my own pace when I want to do it. I want to sleep and wake up when I feel like it. I don't want to have to answer to nobody about nothing ever, ever. I got my cats. Make sure they're taken care of. I take a shower once a week, maybe. <laughs> you know, because it was just like I don't know why I'm doing this, but I don't feel like doing anything else. So after four years of that, it actually got pretty unhealthy, and I felt like, all right, this is, I'm, I, I have a higher purpose. This is not, I'm not just supposed to do this. I have to do something else. I, I don't know, I decided I'm going to write about it. I'm going to get out. I'm going to tour again, even though I said I never was going to tour again. But that's because I thought, my home life was being neglected because I was hitting the road too often. And then I realized, I don't know how to have a home life. It has been so long. I actually, like, that part of my spirit or brain didn't develop. Like, I stunted it in, in my early youth. Or, no, my early adulthood, just touring it all away. I don't know. Maybe I'll figure it out at some point, but it doesn't matter now. All I said was, when 2014 hits, I have to have my purpose, and I have to see my way through the year. I have to hit with a fucking album that reminds people that, like, I didn't fall off. Not in any way. There was like, the lyrics are always there, and they always have been. The delivery is there, the, the live performance is there, and I have to figure out how to interact with people. And the only way I know how to do that is at shows, when I have a purpose. You know, like, it's a strange thing, like, I don't mind being around a whole bunch of people when I know what my purpose is, I'm on stage, I have to put on the show, this is my new home, I know how to, I, I'm very f familiar and comfortable with this environment. But if I was at somebody else's show, and I was just in the crowd, like, that would be a problem for me. Not because I need to get on stage, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I start kind of like, getting anxiety about it and shit. What about those four years in between making this album? What did you learn as far as new tricks artistically? And you think Man, about yourself as a yeah. I, well, for the first time, I did almost everything in my house. Again, I didn't leave my house. I stayed in my house. I recorded the whole album in my house. I've never done that for a record. I usually would go to a professional engineer who know how to record me properly and do multiple takes. What I did everything at my house on a like busted system. I don't even know how it worked. You know, it was a miracle that it all held together by the end. Um, a, a 2005 Mac that I never took care of, that somehow I fit everything on it. I got all the sound files from the multiple producers I work with who came from all over the world. I had producers from the UK, uh, from Sweden, from Australia, from France, from... Uh, all over the ball well, in Canada and all over the place in America, all working with different systems and 
having to like get all these stems from them and, <laughs> and finally when it came time to like do the final mixing of everything oh man alias helped me with that alias mixed the record I put him through hell just like with all these different formats and things that we had to figure out and put everything in the right place and at the right BPM and stuff uh, but we did it all all when we needed to all at the 11th hour and I was lucky because we put out the record ourselves again this was a strange famous records album but my last three records were on Epitaph and I've worked with other labels for every solo release, official studio release. But this is the first one where we debuted it on Strange Famous. And we have one one hundredth of the staff that Epitaph has. And not nearly as much of, a, a, of resources as far as budget is concerned and other random things. So we were, and we switched distributors. We, everything was new, man. We, we were starting from a clean slate. And we're like, this is a big deal. Because if this fucks up, my career could end, but the label's done with. Like, the label was relying on my record to do well. And I know I could probably bounce back as an artist, like, if, if something just failed, if, if something was fucked up. I don't know. I don't want to deal with that. I'm just glad we're not dealing with that right now, because this was... It charted on Billboard Top 200. It got the iTunes top five, and we never push iTunes, because, like, why are we going to push people to iTunes when we sell digitally on our own? You know, so, but that's the default for a lot of people who buy their music digitally. They go to iTunes, and, fuck, the, you know, iTunes gets 40% of the money for what? Because they hosted my album on their website? Fuck that. But that said, when you chart there, you get that recognition where you're like, wow, cats are supporting so other people notice. So there is benefits to it. I just I hate the game, the way the game is played. Um, so in the UK and in the US, we charted on iTunes top five for hip hop. Yeah. Was there pressure in the sense that the artists on Strange Famous were kind of hoping that this al your album would do well in order for their releases to be released on Strange Famous in the future? Was there pressure in that? No, okay. I don't think anyone thought like that except for me. I don't think anyone. Gave, ever ever thought about that it was just in my mind because I know how fragile the system is for us like it's not we're not uh, how do you say it it's, it's not like we can act in a reckless manner on any level we're hanging on hello I find not first yeah oh, no no it's okay <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't think the other artists on the lake, maybe with B. Dolan, because B. Dolan is very involved and we talk all the time and he knows I'm always stressing about this stuff. Because it's my baby, it's like all of my, t like the career is one thing. Maybe I could have just focused on my own career this whole time, but I didn't. I, I developed a label and other artists became my responsibility. Their careers are sort of like part of our responsibility. But I know the label needs my record to do well in order for, the, for us to thrive and for other people to be able to continue to put out projects. I have to stop worrying about that. Like maybe, because I, I, I've said it before, I don't think we're gonna sign any more new artists. Like I don't wanna take on any new responsibilities. I don't wanna develop anyone's career. I wanna focus on my stuff, focus on the people that we're already working with and let that be that, that strange famous record. So maybe new cats will come in and out. We'll always support new stuff, but maybe not like to the level a label acts on. Because who knows if an indie label will be needed in a year or two. If people have their own ways to get stuff out, and if, phys if physical product is just like such a novelty at that point that you don't really need it to be distributed, who knows? So is single song you're most proud of on this album? Oh, uh, a single song I'm most proud of on Copper Gone. Well, for different reasons. Um, Dead Man's Float is one of, I think, a song that could have appeared on other albums. It wasn't particular to Copper Gone. Like, the feel of it and the content of it was not particular to Copper Gone. 
but I, f I freaked certain recording techniques on it and delivery techniques and writing techniques that are very rare. And for it all to work together with a melody and have an overlapping chorus and verses that are sneaky in the way where they come in and out and, and build toward a bigger, a culmination of, of an epic sounding <laughs> chords. I don't know, those, I get, I'm proud of those kind of things. Like those things geek me out. Uh, Cause I don't, I don't go out of my way to write that kind of stuff. But Cecil Otter sent me that beat and uh, I was like, man, I like this. I was like, the mood is giving me, I, like I need to do something epic with this. I don't know what. So I had to really meditate on that and then, you know, constructed the whole thing. It took, probably it took about, well, I can't say, I don't, I don't, I didn't just write it all in one, one session. So it took over a year of me playing around with it until I figured it out. And then once I record it, then I figure out other things I should do with it. So, yeah. But that was one for, for the reasons I explained. Another, make them purr, obviously, I don't, I don't always put myself out there in a very plain manner. So when I do, it's a special circumstance. Same thing with Best of Times. I didn't have to be tricky with the writing on it. But when I'm allowed to just speak plainly and for it to become a song that so many people relate to, that means a lot to me. Because like, there's no trickery involved and I don't have to be playful with it. I just state things as they are. And I'm lucky when things come up, like when, when things develop in an interesting way, because there's repetition patterns in Make em Purr that give it more style than just me speaking plainly uh, or writing like plain couplets. There's, there's other literary techniques that, are, that just appeared as I was writing and it was easy, it just came out. And people are like, why don't you just do that all the time? I'm like, well, because I, I, that means I would write the same exact song every single time. That's why. I can't always write that way because it's just me speaking my exact circumstance. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I like that I keep them for special moments, and they're usually the last song on, on every record that I write. Not in order of the record, but yeah. yeah. Um, I'm proud of almost every, like very proud of almost every single song on that record for different reasons. Um, some of them were harder to nail down than others. Uh, Vonnegut Busy was especially difficult to do just because it actually is three songs mashed into one. A lot of, there's other songs I've done like that and you'll notice there's, there's a chorus, there's a sub-chorus, there is different writing styles and delivery styles on that one song because they kind of came from different places and then I, I figured out how to construct them into one song and hit on different levels. And sometimes when I do that it's because I'll write something and I'll be like, I really like this. It, it's a full song, I really like it, but it, it's, it, it only hits on one level and it's not really multi-layered the way I need things to be. So. Sorry. Sorry, you were saying that? You were, you were saying about how that would, yeah. Yeah, so right. that's one of those songs where I, I try to see how I can fit in other writing or songs that I've, I've put together that also I liked, but I knew it needed something else, and then if I can mash them together and still make them fit, and then I'm like, there we go, yes, that's, that's what it needed. These two things needed to be together. Of course, I have to scrap a lot of writing in the process, but it all works out for the better. You mentioned B. Dolan earlier. What, what does the future hold for Strange Fingers? I mean, could we expect a collaborative album or project with B. Dolan in the future? Is that something you talked about? Yeah, B. Dolan and I have, for quite a while, we've talked about doing more together, and there's always, we're always shooting ideas at each other. And the Epic Beard Men became the mm -hmm. group name without any official release. We just would like record songs together, call it Epic Beard Men, and it would appear on mixtapes. So we're like, when are we gonna have time to like really put out or, or, or sit down and construct a full Epic Beard Men project? I, I hope within the next two years. I think it has to be within the next two years yeah. or it's dead in the water, but uh, 
Yeah. He was just, he's touring with Atmosphere right now, so Ant actually said he might be down to produce some stuff for that. That would be cool. Oh, great. Uh, so we can <laughs> go. We can edit this. It's fine, man. Um, obviously, your music's very cin cinematic, man. It's very visual to me. You mentioned uh, recently, I say recently, a couple of months ago, Andrea from Breaking Bad beginning your show. And of course, you've uh, done a song for Pride and Glory, one of my favorite films, Waterline. Um, should we expect any more? <laughs> songs on future films, or if you would you like to get in, take that route more? Is you yeah, yeah, if I could get some, if I could license songs to films, I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is almost necessary to operate on the levels we're trying to operate on. Yeah, it's not easy, and um, I don't know who the hell I have to work with to make that happen, but it's been a long time since someone has like worked for me in a way where they're willing to license something on an official project. We'll see. And it's also tough working with samples. Like, we do a lot of samples still. It's still outlaw music, so we can't... I mean, I don't want to fuck myself over by just talking about it like this, but we can't license a lot of shit. That's it. Like, that is the... You accept those risks and you accept that you're not going to be making licensing money when you say this beat is too dope not to use but we will get sued eventually <laughs> like, fuck it we're going in yeah, yeah. Um, but not so much on Copper Gone shit I mean we, we curtailed a lot of the sample issues on Copper Gone so that would be awesome I just I mean rest assured those are paydays and it's cool because it's not like you're making a song for a particular product or anything. It's, and you access a whole new audience when you, when you license music to movies and people are hearing you for the first time. They're like, who's this dude? Because when Copper, when, uh, sorry, when Waterline appeared on Pride and Glory, that's how a lot of that worked out, where people like discovered me through a movie that paid me for a song. It's like, double good, you know? Like, fuck yeah. I'll do that in a fucking instant. Touched on a sample as we were talking earlier. It hold on, but it depends on the movie. <laughs> of course, of course. It depends on the movie. It depends on how the movie is. It, that's for sure. But yeah. No, I don't movies anytime soon. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> you mentioned um, sampling, obviously, and you mentioned the application earlier that you want to get into. Yeah. Do we expect Sage Francis producing using uh, application, phone applications in the future? Yeah, uh, maybe. Um, I've been. I'll tell you what, I've been collecting records since the early 90s, I, no, maybe the late 80s. Um, I have a whole room filled with them, most of them I know I want to, like they're samples, and I, I've recorded a lot of them and I have them saved, and I need to go through them. In 99, I worked through the summer to purchase an MPC that I never used. A few years later, I purchased an SP-1200 that I never used, but I'm like, I got everything, I got everything I need, I know what I'm going to do. I did tinker around with beats for a little while, and I was fairly good, but like, I, I didn't have enough time to focus on that. My career picked up like so much things I had to do, and it was like, it's best to leave the, the beats to other people, and I'm more of a producer overall, not just like making the beats, but I'd like to do that. I don't know, it doesn't matter through what tool. I know what I want to make, how I just don't know how to put them the way I want they need to be. So I don't know. It's, it's been what 20 years of me trying to figure that out. Yeah. I still want to learn another language, I want to learn an instrument. I don't know, I haven't been to Barbados. Yeah. So much to do, so yeah. much room for activities. He offered her the world but came up short The nastiest of storms made him settle on a city with a port He watched ships sail by in the middle of July He wrote notes on paper boats, sat and waited for reply Hope floats